Hey guys, Daniel here. I mean, this is another video. My guest needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, my name is Daniel Fee. I'm a coder, which is a child of a deaf adult. Uh, you may have seen that film, I Don't Sing, but I do interview. And in this video, I am absolutely ecstatic and honored to chat with the amazing David Goyer. I mean, where do I begin? He's a writer. You may know him for stuff like Man of Steel, Batman Begins, Blade, and much, much more. He's an occasional director with stuff like Blade Tree, Zigzag, The Invisible. And one of my favorite shows I'm so excited to get into. He's also the showrunner behind Apple Epic Foundation, which I believe was shot here in the Emerald Isle. I'm going to pick your brain on that later on. Uh, and even more recently, he's one of the people behind Sandman, which is, I, I believe, number one on Netflix. I mean, all right, everyone in the world is watching it. So, David, thank you so much for coming on, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No worries. I mean, you know, I've just listed off so many things. We can just jump right into it. So, I mean, let me start with Sandman. I mean, yeah. how did this project come to you? Because right now, you know, I'm sure you've seen the hype. It's just been all over everywhere. People seem to be loving it. Did you expect this response? Did you expect it to elicit this response? Um, We hoped it would have this kind of response. I think we always felt like it deserved this kind of response. But you never know. I mean, you never know how people are going to respond to it. I mean, I've I've been a fan of Sandman. I I read the first issue when it came on the stands back in the days when I was going to my local comic book shop uh, every week. Yeah, I think that was in '89, uh, just getting out of college. Um, and once I became a screenwriter, I would I would I would inquire about it. You know, over the first decade, and at various points, it was being developed by. A whole variety of people seemed inappropriate for it. I and, can imagine. Because Sandman yeah. seems to be kind of, it's one of those comics, like, I, I think I kind of hold it up next to Watchmen. It's like, if I yeah. was a writer and you told me to adapt a comic and you said, you know, here's a list of stuff we love, Watchmen, Sandman. I'd be like, no, I'm not doing it. No, 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 I'll do anything else. But it's just such a grand world. And it seems like, like, obviously, Neil put so much into the comic, him and, like, the rest of the crew. And, you know, it, it would just work so well in the comic book form that bringing it to life kind of seems like such a feat that, like, I don't know if I would be willing to do it. So someone like you, I feel, is just the perfect person. Like, obviously, you and the team to help bring the Sandman to life. Well, after after Batman Begins came out, you know, I had, first it was Blade and then things like Dark City and then Batman Begins. I had a little more uh, clout, I guess, particularly with Warner Brothers. And so I kept... I kept checking in on it and I kept trying to convince them streaming didn't exist then, but HBO did. And I kept trying to convince them, but, uh, as you know, a premium cable show and yeah. the feature division never wanted to give it up. And then I would say about 10 years ago, finally the feature side said, okay, we'll let you try to do something with it, but we still want it to be a feature. And I begged them to do it as a show. And they said, no, and I said, okay, well, can we at least get Neil involved? Because Neil Gaiman had never been involved in any of the uh, versions that were developed, which I thought was just criminal. So we did um, sort of our best shot at an adaptation with a fantastic writer named Jack Thorne, who's done tons of things, uh, you know, in the UK and, and throughout. There was a version where I had written the treatment and Jack Thorne did a, a draft, and then we did... Another draft with Eric Heiserer, who's uh, doing Shadow and Bone now, who also did an interesting draft. But it was still, we were still trying to cram this whole epic story down into two hours, and yeah. it was never going to work. So maybe five years ago, I finally, finally, finally convinced the feature division of Warner Brothers and the TV division to let us make it as a streaming show. And at that point, I said, I have one more ask. I want Neil to write the pilot with me. Yeah, and um, it took about four years for our schedules to align. And by that point, I was doing foundation. So then we realized we needed help, and we brought in Alan Heinberg, who'd done lots of shows, written comics, The Young Avengers, yeah. uh, written Wonder Woman, and Alan was sort of the third tier. And these days, I kind of handle foundation from day to day, and Alan handles Sandman from day to day. But yeah. I would say there isn't a day that goes by that that Neil and Alan and I aren't on a Zoom, you know, talking about the art for the ad campaign or the casting of who, who's going to do the voice of Merv Pumpkinhead or something like that. <laughs> the and, important decisions, the important yes, decisions. Yes, yes. Yeah. And fortunately, 
I think the big thing was part of the thing that makes Sandman great. Yeah. And it's part of the thing that also makes Foundation great. Some of these great things great. Dune great is because they're these big, giant, sprawling, original yeah. things that defy sort of being crunched down into yeah. a neat little box. That's what makes them amazing. Yeah. And you so can't the very thing, them down. You can't make yeah, them smaller. Yeah. It'd be unfair. Same, same with Game of Thrones. P- people were like, oh, we can't do a show with 35 characters. And, and, you know, you just have to hope that as you gain some street cred in the entertainment business that you can reach a point where you can say, no, you're wrong. Yeah. This is amazing. It doesn't need to be turned into some generic piece of junk. Yeah. Don't try to turn it into something it's not. Let it be what it needs to be. Yeah. And so there were still some changes we made for Sandman, but it fundamentally, you know, the show that it needed to be. Yeah, it has the heart of the comic. And I feel like, you know, as far as adaptations could go, it's like, that's the, like, it's the best adaptation we are possibly going to get. It's it's really amazing. Uh, but so, I mean, seeing the success of it, is this just like a regular Tuesday for you? Like everyone's just complimenting, you know, David Gurren is working like, yeah, well, listen, you know, well, listen, you guys said it. Is that how it works? I mean, I'd be eating it up, you know, I'm not humble at all. I'd be thinking, well, yeah, you're right. I am amazing. So what's it like for you seeing, seeing it be such a successful show? I- you know, unfortunately, I've been doing this a long time and I've had a lot of successes and a lot yeah. of failures. And I think maybe at the beginning, you're not so humble, but I'm a little more humble now. I'd like to think I sort of know what I'm doing. Yeah. But, you know, I also have three sons who... And they keep you humble, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're like, whatever, dad, or they're like something I think is amazing. They think that was lame or, you know... So we sit around the dinner table and it's, I just have a normal dinner like everyone else with my kids. That's important. Like tomorrow I'll be telling all my friends, I interviewed David Goyer and they'll tell me to shut up. But you know, I know that that means something to me. So that's all that matters. Uh, But no, so we've also talked about something like Foundation, which is of course an adaptation of a novel as well. Is, was, would you consider Foundation in the same vein as Sandman and just being really hard to adapt or was it harder, easier? What challenges did you kind of approach with Foundation? They're both... They're both really difficult to adapt, and they both defied adaptation for decades. Yeah. And I I seem to have fallen into this niche where that's kind of my thing now, is I, I develop things and get things made that are really hard to adapt. Um, Foundation's problem was that the story spans a thousand years. So there's all these big time jumps. And in the original uh, book, which is a collection of short stories, there aren't that many characters that continue. It's almost an anthology. There aren't many characters that continue from one yeah. one story to the next. Um, you know, it was also written in the shadow of uh, World War II uh, during the Cold War, 48, 49, 50. It was written at a time where Virtually every character in the first book, I think they all were, were men. It was implied that they were Caucasian. And, you know, we live in a, in a multi-cultured, multi-gender world now. And so that was one of the obvious things that needed to be, uh, I felt, adapted. And it's, you know, I worked very closely with Asimov's daughter. Um, he, of course, passed away, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s. Might have been late 90s. Yeah. But I worked very closely with her and Robin Asimov. And whenever we make a change, I say, do you think this is something that yeah. your father would have appreciated? Or your father talked about, you know, in the last 10 years of his life. And and so she's kind of the North Star that keeps us honest in that regard. But yeah, they're both difficult yeah. adaptations. Yeah, I have to commend you on that, you know, with paying respect to the creator. Because, I mean, you know... I, I love these films and I love now we're seeing like people are credited like Suicide Squad, you know, at the end of that, there's just a list of comic book creators. And that made me really happy to see, you know, getting to see. And so the fact that you pay such respect and obviously helping to bring that to the screen and giving it that gate, that, that David Goyer, you know, brilliance to it, you can help kind of sh- shift it for the current world we live in. So would you say 
what's interesting there you brought up about foundation kind of being timely you know because of course you know if I wrote a novel now and then in 80 years time people would look back at it and then say well that's different now the world's a different place so was there some challenges there in trying to kind of change up some things while still keeping to the core of the novel um not really in a way because his his asimov's central point of foundation right yeah history progresses in cycles and that if you chart mankind you know back to the beginning of their various empires whether it be you know mesopotamia or the egyptian empire or all you know empires in um the rest of africa or yeah. china there are these patterns that occur over and over again there are seasonal floods there are famines there are the, these things aren't new right yeah. there are plagues um and and there are certain ways that society reacts to them ways that are beneficial and ways that you know to cause more problems and so in in some ways that's a good thing because we can look at the sort of history of human behavior and we can say or we should be able to say yeah. okay that that worked that didn't work that worked that didn't work let's not do that again right yeah. but that hasn't changed here we and are in 2022 yeah, and you know we lots and lots of people have written about you know the pandemic, uh, you know in 1917, 1918, yeah. and lo and behold, a hundred years later, we're still making the same mistakes. Are you saying we don't learn as a society? No, surely we I do mean, not. I would on. say as a society we learn, but it's almost like it's five steps forward, four steps back. Totally. I mean, every single time. And, and that that's that was Asimov's central point. And that that doesn't change. The players change, but here we are again dealing with the rise of nationalism. Here we are again, you know, 70 years later, dealing with the same crap. People questioning freedom of the press. How dare they write the truth? It's the same crap. So what people should take away from the interview is that we should just abandon the world. Every nothing matters anymore, and that you know, all eventually we're going to return to dust and die. Yeah, okay. That or, this... or or maybe we should just put our faith in robots. I don't know. Yeah. Well, listen. I mean, you said it. That's 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 just my soundbite. That's all I really needed. Now I'll get yeah. an article from that. Uh, but no, let me pick your brain on this. This is something I've kind of realized. I've interviewed. Uh, I don't know if you know Neil Blomkamp, who directed District Nine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. District 9, what's really fascinating to me about that is that it's a film that deals with racism and segregation, but it's with aliens. And I was chatting with Scott Snyder about this as well, that it's almost easier to digest those real, to like you just brought up there, how, you know, as a society, sometimes we do horrible things most times. And when you can like kind of express that in a sci-fi show, do you feel like that's easier for some people to digest? Like Superman, that's, um, that's kind of, that's a tale of immigration. But is, But if it was like, you know, if it was a film about a black man's experience in America, then it would be different for people to digest. So do you feel like it's easier in sci-fi or films or superhero films for people to digest these meanings and still get that message across? I do. Or rather, I think that I, sometimes these kinds of films reach a broader audience. Mm. You know, there yeah. are, and I'm not taking anything away from them, but there are certain films that you know are issue films or yeah, yeah. films that the Academy Awards is going to vote for. And they're a beautifully made movie, but maybe only a small slice of the demographic are going to watch. And those films are really important. But the problem is sometimes with those films is a lot of the people that need, maybe need to watch those films are never going to watch those films because right. they say, I don't want to watch an art film. So I think it's important, like Blade. Blade is a movie about race. Yeah. Oh, totally. Blade was absolutely a movie about race. It just happened to be a movie about vampires versus humans as opposed to, you know, a divide between white people and black people or, or vice versa. And so I think it's really important to Superman is absolutely an immigrant story. It's a story about acceptance. It's also an adoption story, you know, a story yeah. about oh, yeah. uh, 
who am I true to, you know, my birth father or my adoptive father? And sometimes I think that that stories like these are going to reach a broader audience. If you can entertain people while talking about something that's important, sometimes you can make more headway. Um, and it's really important to remember that fundamentally you're still creating a piece of entertainment. And so you always have to make sure that your message isn't overshadowing the entertainment itself. Yeah. People don't like to be preached to. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's such a huge element of it. Like, you look at Man of Steel, were you ever nervous kind of, you know, showing Superman? Because, I mean, look, let's be honest. If Superman came down from the sky, he'd be met with, like, just people wouldn't really understand it. They'd be terrified. They would have signs. Oh, people would lose their minds, I'm they'd, sure. They'd stand outside the White news. House. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I'm, people I'm in sure Ireland people would stock up on bread for some reason because we did that last time. There was a tornado coming or something. So we said, let's get bread and milk. So we do that if Superman came down. So... You know, when you inject that realism, are you ever afraid you're making it too realistic or do you, is there kind of a dichotomy? Can you kind of blend it? I mean, it's always a concern and it's it's something that we as filmmakers discuss and we say, well, how how real is this too close to reality or not? And sometimes yeah. you pull things back and sometimes you don't. And even as much as you make your best attempt or your best guess, Sometimes the audience reacts in a way that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, you you can't, but by the same token, you can't sit there as someone who's making a show or a movie or a comic book and think, geez, what are all the possible ways that I might offend someone in some yeah. way that I can't? And the funny thing, sometimes what happens with the people that work at studios or the editors at a comic book company is, I almost think sometimes they spend too much time. I call it defensive notes. They sit there and they all they do is try to think, how might someone be insulted by this? Well, if you spend yeah. all your days thinking about that, you can find a person to be insulted about anything. And, and you know, sometimes people will be insulted by it or will take offense. And it's impossible to create a of art that isn't going to rub some people the wrong way yeah it's impossible to put a law to legislate a law and have a law be perfect it's it, there's you know perfection is the enemy of the good it's impossible yeah. to have the platonic ideal of everything we yeah. knew we knew we might ruffle some feathers with man of steel we knew we might ruffle some feathers with foundation we knew there might be some feather hold because we dared to cast death not as yeah that's crazy 22 year old winona rider yeah exactly what's that about would you not just get a time machine and fix that that's just, i mean that's just lazy i mean i have to be honest, like you just fix, make a time machine or something but no that is i mean it's crazy people complaining about you know race swap like you know race swapping and stuff like that and saying oh character isn't how they look in the comic well, that's why it's an adaptation. Go outside and touch some grass and stop being so weird about it. It doesn't make a difference to you. And it's crazy when people said, like, just enjoy the show. Don't look for, you know, yeah, what you brought up there. Don't look to be offended. Just enjoy well, media for what it is. He, but the other thing, part of it, too, is we live in a world. And, and look, this is pretty heady for your show, maybe. But we live in an ecosystem now. The I don't make money. Say what you want. Just No, but I'm saying we live in a clickbait ecosystem. We live in a system of internet outrage, right? Yeah. Outrage gets more clicks than people saying positive things. It just does. TikTok, Twitter, whatever, you know, Reddit. The stuff that's outraged gets more interest and gets more eyeballs. It gets more controversy. And so we we also live in a world where people feed that, you know, when when people do interviews, they're always looking for, oh, is there is there anything in here that's a gotcha that we can print as a headline that people can be out over? Well it's you also, said 
we should yeah. just give in to the robots. So that's kind of my gotcha. So you yeah. did say that. So I did get you on that. That's, I'm doing this all for Well, I think, I think, well, I would argue maybe we have given into the ro- the algorithm, the great God, the algorithm. I was got, I, 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 I started out with pure intentions, but I've been consumed at the ripe age of 14. I'm done. I'm finished. My career's over. Uh, but no, on a lighter note, let me ask you this. You actually came over to the Emerald Isle to shoot Foundation, right? We did. We were, didn't shoot the whole show there, but we shot, I think we shot there on season one for about four months, perhaps. And we were there for about a year. We, yeah. we shot for about four months. And on season two, we shot there for about two months um, in Troy Studios, which is outside of Limerick. Dude, if there's a season three, I'll let you visit, you know. I'll, I'll get you'll, my let, you'll let me visit? I'll think about it. I'm on the fence. Depending on how the rest of this interview goes, I'll see. You know, you're being good enough right now. But, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll think about letting you visit, you know. I have Black Ops 2 upstairs, you know. That's basically all. Uh, but no, totally, dude. When you come back, let me know. And I have a big stack of your JSA and stuff to get you to sign, you know. Uh, but yeah, totally. So if, if there is a season three, we'd be coming back to Ireland. I don't honestly know, and I'll I'll tell you why. Love Ireland. We spent, I spent at least half a year there over my last three years. My kids lived over there. We loved it. We ended up living um, in Adair Village, uh, which was lovely. And we we, we used to go out (laughs) to the... um, to the wild Atlantic way um, all the time in the Burren. Loved it, loved it, loved oh, it. Oh, I went to the Burren, yeah. I only did that recently, and it was like the first time, you know. But yeah, yeah. The, Bur- the, Burren is, the Burren is what Tolkien based Middle Earth on. Yeah, I don't know if they're just saying that for publicity. I went in and I was like, yeah, did he though? Because I mean, you I know. Think I think so. I, I mean, we know he was there, and you certainly take a walk around there, and it feels like a hobbit is going to pop up at some point. But I, I would say the issue with... <clears throat> Um, season three, if there's a season three and four, is um, uh, there's less because we're sort of like Game of Thrones in that we go to these new worlds and 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 each new world is different and we definitely are in a place if this moves forward where there's less sort of uh, green forests and whatnot. Let me tell you, Ireland, that you went to the nice place of Ireland. You try coming to Dublin, you'll definitely find a new a new uh, area to shoot. It's like its own mythical land, you know? It's like it's like we its own also, We also shot in uh Trinity Library, but they're they're um they're refurbishing and we can't shoot there. We actually needed wow. to go back to Trinity Library. Dude, I went to Trinity Library before. Did you see the Book of Kells? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a page, really. I mean, I, I they built it up to me, and I was like, "Yes, we're gonna go see." It. And I was like, "Oh man, it's in like a two two foot, you know, glass cage, and that's all we get to see." So me and my friends just messed around. But yeah, that's just that just shows. Uh, but no, totally, man. If you ever come back, I'll think about letting you visit. No promises. I am very busy nowadays. Uh, I my people will talk to your people. We we'll see if we can work something. Perfect, out. perfect. There you go. That's all it needs. Uh, but no. So obviously, when you look at your work, uh, of all the comic book properties you've worked on, is there a character? world team you'd, you'd like to tackle or are you more content doing stuff like foundation and maybe you know pursuing some of your own stuff or is there any you, characters you mean do you mean if i were to write new comic book work yeah maybe or just any characters that you still want to tackle i've always been interested in writing the hulk dude he's such uh, a great character i did yeah. he's just like that i have to that. say i have to say greg pack and al ewing i mean Al Ewing, they've they've done so much amazing work with the Hulk. Immortal Hulk years. is just yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to beat Immortal Hulk. That was pretty brilliant. Yeah, and I think like that. There's obviously that. Like, I love the Hulk films we've got, but I'd love to see one that kind of explored that anger between a man who literally cannot help but turn into a monster. You know, I mean, I was watching videos like, you know, Stanley obviously, and you know, the crew made it with that Jekyll and Hyde Frankenstein type atmosphere. I think that would just lend itself amazingly you, i don't know you might get it it seems like they're teasing some of the world war hulk stuff in in the new she hulk show i love that i love that i mean that would just be fantastic but yeah is there ever a fear it's something you brought up there it's hard to be a mortal hulk is there ever a fear like 
when you, like say if I was writing a Superman film and I look before me, it's like there's a Grant Morrison one, there's all these different writers. I'm like, oh, do I have to? How do I even top that? Was that ever a fear going in, or were you like, I just want to tell something new, and were you just determined to tell your story? Sure. I mean, I I would only take on the Hulk, whatever, another one of these characters if I if I felt like I had something new or different to say. So yeah. when I when we were doing Batman Begins, some of the stuff that we were mining had been in Batman One and some of the other some of the like Denny O'Neill, um, Neil right. Adams books, but that had never been explored on film before. So we felt like um not that we were completely pulling from that but that 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 was an area that had never really been explored on film before and superman is an immigrant story they'd explored that somewhat in the comic books but again no one had had done a kind of postmodern take on superman before so that felt fresh um you know it just depends on on whether or not there's always a new story you can tell i mean someone someone will come around six years from now and write some amazing Green Arrow story that everyone's saying, oh my God, I never thought to use Green Arrow in that way. And Green Arrow and- is a metaphor for capitalism. This is beautiful storytelling. Exactly. I, mean, I, I they Come back to this in six years. I guarantee you someone steals that idea. Exactly. But one of my millions of fans, I assume, is some big comic book writer. But no, that is interesting about coming up with something new because it's obviously daunting to go into something like that. Is it? Because I was recently talking to Brian Azzarello and I asked him, how hard is it for you to come up with a new idea where there's been thousands of ideas for characters? And he goes, well, actually, it's pretty easy because a lot of the stories are just the same stories told over and over again. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you agree with that? Yeah, they are. They are. I recently, I, it was published a few years ago, but there's this amazing book called All the Marvels about um, this... Uh, I think his last name is Wolk, W-L-K, about this guy that sat down over the course of three years and read all 27,000 Marvel comics that had been published from 1961 to the present, except for the ones that have been licensed. Mm-hmm. And he kind of gives you this overview of this story over the last Get out you know, 60 years. And the point is, yeah, it is the same story over and over and over again. Brilliant. Uh, but one, one another question I'd like to ask you is, out of all of your projects, what do you consider to be the ultimate David Goyer project? If you were to hand a film, you know, a TV show, a script or something, say this sums up who I am as a writer. Is there anyone? Is there one project in particular? Wow, that's really hard. Um, but now that I, we're casually 30 minutes into yeah, our yeah. conversation. I, 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 guess, I guess I would pick two only because I, I'm. there's a ton of me in Batman Begins. There's a ton of me in City, but those films also had a ton of Alex Proyas and Chris Nolan in them you know it was sort of a combination but I would say that the um the the first blade uh is um that was the first time I was allowed to write a script the way I wanted to write it without a lot of studio interference and even though I look back on that movie and I can see that I wrote it when I was quite young. This sort of crazy invention and everything uh, in that film is very much what was existing in the first few drafts. And it's just kind of ex- and a pure expression of me. And I also think, I think the pilot of Foundation um, oh, is yeah. a lot of me. And then, and the season finale of season one of Foundation, because I wrote and directed it. And that one I wrote, a lot of our episodes we co-write. Um, yeah. But that one I wrote completely on my own and directed on my own. And and so that's probably a, also kind of a very pure expression of what I want to say. Yeah, totally. And you've talked about just that kind of unbridled creative freedom. Like, I mean, Blade One, which I mean, Stephen Norrington, who worked on it, one of my favorite directors. He is just so immensely talented. That's another example. In terms of his directing, you know, one of the things that was great, Michael DeLuca, who ran New Line at the time, just yeah. really trusted Steve and I to do our thing yeah. and to go for it. And it's rare that you get that opportunity. Yeah, I would situation. imagine for something as big as like these <clears throat> characters, because there's obviously, I think, certain confines. Like the way I look at it, like Garth Dennis, I'm not sure if you've ever read some of sure. his He's done stuff like The Punisher, and his Punisher, I consider, some of the greatest comic book work of all time. But at the same time, he's he's written Punisher comics, which include 
the IRA, which are these real things. Like, as, as far as creative freedom goes, we're never going to see the IRA in a Punisher film. It's just because no. that's the line. So I feel like there are just some things you just cannot do. And creative freedom, I feel, can only go so far, especially when you're working with pre-established characters. Well, yeah, it, that's true. When, when you're working with a pre-established property, I remember when we were writing Batman Begins over the course of the process, Chris, um, you know, it, I, it was his third, technically it was his fourth film. He, he had an early film that not that many people had seen, but um, he wasn't Chris Nolan in quotes yet, but he was an up and coming respected director. And he had a very um, uh, acute observation, which is he said, I realized that, that this, property Batman has existed for over 70 years and there have already been all of these these iterations of him and he said I realize that Batman is bigger than we are and yeah. so we can't make a Chris Nolan film that has Batman in it we have to make a Batman film yeah directed by Chris Nolan we, we have to honor what exists and so when you're dealing with the giant hallowed properties um, whether it be Sandman, Foundation, anything like that, you have to try to um, color within the lines. But there's also some beauty in that. Uh, and the other thing is that the more expensive a project is, the more people are going to want to weigh in because uh, their jobs are on the line. Uh, the cheaper a project is, maybe they give you a little more freedom. Are you telling me this is about money? Is this... Is this what you're telling me? No, I don't believe it. I think it, often, I... it often is from the people who are financing it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so let me just like, this is just a pure curiosity question. You've done some slide comic book work before and stuff like JSA. Would, are you ever thinking about returning to the comic book world? Are you happy doing stuff like screenwriting? Does that thought ever enter your head? Yeah, it's, it's not impossible. I enjoy comics. I don't read them month to month anymore. I tend to wait until the trades come out. Yeah. But it's not impossible, and I've I've had some conversations. Um, believe it or not, Ryan Sook and I have been having some conversations over the, over the last year. Um, it's about finding the right idea and finding the right window in order to do it. But I, I wouldn't say it's impossible. As far as artists go, Ryan Sook is. I mean, up there, he's, 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 he's brilliant. Booster gold stuff. And um, let me ask you this: Would you ever work on Condiment King? Do you not know? Do you know who Condiment uh, King is? Yeah, I know who Condiment King is. Oh, because if you don't, I was about to tell you, and that would have been my article. I bring this up. I've infiltrated the comic book world by bringing up Condiment King. Now I'm going to do it in the TV world. So, you know, when, when we get in that Condiment King show, is he your favorite Batman villain? I mean, yeah, Joker and Two-Face only go so far, but when there's a character like Condiment King, is he your, would you describe him as your favorite comic book character? No, but I'll say this. I Every, one of the things that I've learned is that every character no matter how seemingly ridiculous they are in the right hands can be amazing. I'm not sure that I would do a Frank Miller style condiment King story. That but character calls for it. I mean, if there's, you, there's ever... probably, there's probably an amazing condiment King story out there somewhere. Yeah. I have my own creator on comic called the Relish Ravager coming out uh, completely unrelated. So DC can't really arrest me. I mean, they can bring it up, but it won't go very far. So, you know, I, I found all the creative loopholes and stuff like this. But no, let me ask you, what are some of your favorite comic books of all time? Is, do you have a list or does that just, is that the biggest question I could possibly ask you? Do you have like a Mount Rushmore of comic books? I mean, there's like a lot of people, there isn't necessarily, um, you know, I, I grew up as a, kid first and then as a dc kid and then i branched out so there are, are runs of things yeah. you know the immortal hulk is amazing i liked when um pack was doing hulk um i like roger stern as yeah. a writer um i like what tom king is doing these days uh you know mobius um monstrous i mean it it it, it kind of runs the gamut. I loved yeah. what Alan Heinberg was doing with the Young Avengers uh, at the time. You know, I think Hickman is yeah. a genius. I, uh, what he did with the Avengers and Fantastic Four and Secret Wars, amazing. He, I also brought him into Da Vinci's Demons and he co-wrote an episode. Him and the fantastic Matt Fraction, who was just... Matt Fraction, I love. I, I, I follow his work. I follow Kelly Sue's work. Um, 
Matt Fraction is a legend. He's one of my best friends, basically. I mean, he doesn't know it, but I know it, and that's all that matters, you know. And that's you're on great. my you're on my best friend list as well, David. Don't worry. Okay. You're, you know, at the start of the interview, I was debating on whether or not I'd let you stay at my house, but you've been so good, and I've been doing a lot of thinking. You can stay in my house. You can take the couch. You know. Oh, thank you. Thank Sorry, you. That that was that was very hard for me to say. I get emotional sometimes. Uh, but no, totally. You know. This was a question that Scott Snyder was recently asked at Dublin Comic Con, not by me, actually, by someone else. But when you're doing these characters, is it hard to know that you're doing a true version of these characters and not your version? Or do you want to do David Goyer's, you know, Superman, Batman? Or is it well, hard that's, to that's, inside that mode? That's, that's what I was relating to when I mentioned that comment by Chris Nolan, is if, if I were to do a creator-owned comic, yeah. something fully original, then yeah, that would be my expression but um i would never want to if i took a stab at writing the hulk or batman or something again i would never try to do something that was my version of batman i would try to do my take on batman but have it still feel like it was batman and that it yes. still or, or the hulk or still felt in yeah, you know, fell in the continuity of the Hulk. I wouldn't try to do something completely crazy that just is not the goes against the DNA of the character. Yeah, but I feel like do you feel like now that you're kind of better at it? Like when you look at something like Man of Steel, you are kind of better than you are at Blade. I kind sure. of fitting in that sure. character. Yeah. Is it just one big learning curve? Do you feel? Yeah. Look, I, I, it is a big learning curve, and I, I felt that Man of Steel. Yes, it was a postmodern take. Postmodern uh, take on man, of Super. I felt that Man of Steel was coloring within the Superman lines. There were some people that took issue with um, him killing Zod at the end, which I understand. Some people have said Superman doesn't kill, but it, it's interesting. We had proposed that situation to the editors at and the publishers at DC Comics, and they felt we should do it. Yeah. And then, so it was a, because the point was we put him in a situation where he had to, he didn't want to. Yeah. And, and I felt that that's what happens in life sometimes. And you know, we were trying to paint a realistic story. You know, could we have come up with a version where he somehow didn't? Yes. But it was part of his character arc was that he's learning to, accept that life is precious and you have to be yeah. really careful and people can misinterpret what you do. And we, the story, part of that story was we were putting him in an impossible situation. I think what people tend to want is a perfect Superman, but that's not, that's not like, I mean, you can only do so much with perfect Superman because he has to be, whether or not you like it, he has to be like us in some way, in some other binary sense. So that's, that's really fascinating that you brought. David, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Now that we've My been pleasure. So deep. I mean, you know, we've been through a lot on this interview, you know, because obviously we've just been doing it since the last, you know, a half an hour or so. You've changed your shirt. I've gone on my own journey. There was no cutting in between. Uh, before we finish up, are you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that? Nothing. I'm on no social media at all. But that's always such a fun and positive place, you know? I cannot believe that. That's a shot. Uh, any new projects people can go check out or anything you can promote? Obviously, people should watch Sandman. Yeah. Um, my producing partner and I have a reboot of Hellraiser coming out on Hulu next month. Yeah, the, uh, literally the first look of that was released yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah. It looks uh, amazing. We have a, we have another film that's going into production in two weeks, which is a period prequel to the Omen, first Omen. Um, that's going to star star Nell Tiger Free, and then people should watch the news for um. An announcement in the next few months uh, on the season two of Foundation, and there's nice. there's one other thing I'm going to start working on adapting, but I can't say what it is yet. But it's a property that's very well known in the science fiction and fantasy world. I assume you're referring to our Conan and King series. It's fine. That, that you nailed it. No one needs to know about it. You know, yeah. it's like ninety percent me, ten percent you. It's my Watchmen of Conan yeah. and King. No, David, uh, it, it's truly been an immense honor chatting with you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, everyone, thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, let me just take this minute to say, everyone, 
Declan Shalvey's old dog comes out on September 29th. My friend, you may know him for stuff like Moon Knight and stuff like that, but everyone, you can go pre-order that from your local comic book store. Uh, as always, you can follow me over on Twitter. I'm not I'm not as good as David. I unfortunately am oh, so I, I will say this. I'm not on social media, but you can go to davidsgoyer.com. Oh, yeah. And we periodically post updates and, and behind-the-scenes pictures on that and also... Uh, my production company phantom4.com so there's there's some information on those sites totally link for that in the description but yeah thank you guys so much for watching as always please make sure to donate to the national death student society and uh, just link for that down in the description but yeah thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you all in the next video condiment king comes out soon or relish ravager depending on whether or not dc let me do it thank you so much everyone